Hello friends, Steve from Southern Illinois again here. Sorry I'm late. <clears throat> no excuses. Unavoidable. So, last week I kind of glossed through, rushed through a Bible passage that is pretty problematic for Christians who have been born and bred on the New Testament. And that's the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Second Commandment, talking about not bowing down to idols, includes this statement that God is a jealous God who visits, visits the iniquity of the fathers on, to, on the children to the third and fourth generations. It just creates this image of this vengeful father who, yeah, tortures people. And it's interesting that while on the one hand, New Testament Christians tend to object to this image of God in the Old Testament while embracing the concept of eternal hell. So how do I deal with this? Okay, first of all, this concept of God visiting the, the sins of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations is definitely a part of the worldview, the spiritual view, the spiritual life of people in the Old Testament. It's, it's stated repeatedly, both in terms of the abstract, God will do this, and in the terms of the concrete, bad things happen to his children because God was punishing them for their father's sins. This, this, there's several examples of this through the Old Testament. But at the same time, it's countered multiple times by assertions that only the person who sins will be punished. Okay, Even in the writings of Moses in Deuteronomy, say it again, Deuteronomy is the retelling of the stories and the, the, the guidance that God had given in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And in Deuteronomy, God specific, specifically tells Moses, don't punish the children for the sins of the fathers. The prophets Ezekiel and Isaiah take it from a command to people not to punish the children to God saying, I will only punish the father. If his son lives a righteous life, he will not be punished for the sins of his fathers. If he lives an unrighteous life, then he will bear the guilt of his own sins. When you get to the New Testament, this third and fourth generation stuff almost completely disappears. Once Jesus mentions um, the generation that he was dealing with bearing the sins of the generations before. But he does it in the sense of, fill up the sins of your fathers. They killed the prophets. You're trying to kill me. The rest of the New Testament doesn't mention it at all. Instead, this concept of God punishing temporally in this world, the children to the third and fourth generation, is replaced with three different concepts. Number one, in Romans uh, chapter 6, we have the concept of sin bearing fruit unto death. That when we sin, the consequences of sin are death. Now, in our modern thinking, this is pretty common thought. You know, you smoke, you increase your chance of lung cancer, heart attack, stroke. Okay. The concept of cause and effect of our actions bearing fruit unto death is very part of our modern concept, and that's found in the New Testament. You also have the concept of sins, wickedness, being punished by earthly authorities. And then finally, you have the ultimate of 
this temporal judgment in this world being replaced by an end time judgment where each of us face the consequences of our behavior, of our actions. So how do I deal with this? You know, it sounds like I'm saying that uh, the Bible says different things in different places. And for those of us who have been taught that the Bible has uniform authorship that extends down to the level of the words that were selected by the original authors and by certain translations, this is problematic. So we come up with all of these harmonizations, rationalizations of why statements that appear to be conflicting are not. Paradoxically, the skeptics adopt that same framework. Well, if it says this here and it says that there, then obviously they both can't be right, and you're saying that the, the, the Word of God is infallible, so you're wrong. So literal inspiration, verbal inspiration, that feeds right into the skeptic's claims. On the other hand, if you accept the idea that God is trying to communicate with people where they are, with you and I where we are, then he has to take our context into consideration. Now, as a doctor, as a family doctor, I've spent a lot of time trying to help people understand how to take care of their bodies. How to eat. Here in America, I would talk about foods that contain cholesterol, the importance of not having excess calories in our diet, and most of the time people understand what I'm talking about. That language is familiar with us. We may not know exactly what, it, what cholesterol is, but we know that it's something that can be bad for us. When I was in Africa, the language that was common to the people around me didn't have a word for cholesterol, didn't even have a word for protein, didn't even have the concept of biochemistry and food being constructed of chemicals. Explaining things to them in the language that we used here in the United States was meaningless. The translators would look at me blankly. There was this humorous story they told. An American health educator came over and and in trying to contextualize his message of health, he ended up saying that bread that had color was healthier than bread that was white. Now, he was trying to communicate whole grains are healthier than refined grains. But what it translated to, you see, bread was sold at little roadside stands. It would be wrapped in a plastic bag and you'd have these loaves of bread sitting on these these roadside stands as you went down the road in certain parts of the city. And it was it was interesting. You'd go down the road and you'd see white bread. And then you would see blue bread. And then you'd see yellow bread. And blue bread and yellow bread both cost more than white bread because colored bread is healthier than white bread. You see, the, you see the difficulty that arises when you ignore the contextualization of the message? And I think that's what we're dealing with here. When God was speaking to the Hebrews in at Mount Sinai. 
they had no concept of cause and effect in natural events. To them, everything that happened in life was a result of the actions of gods. That's what they had been taught. That was the way their culture was shaped. And teaching them cause and effect when they had no idea, well, today we have ideas, we, we understand that how we live affects our health, cause and effect. In the last 20 years, we have started learning how powerfully adverse childhood events, sin experienced by children, affects us biologically and even genetically and can be transmitted onto our children. In our era, the idea of sin being trans, the consequences of sin being transmitted down to children is now a cause and effect event. A child who is sexually abused is much more likely to become a sexual abuser. A child who experiences violence is much more likely to be physically violent with family members when he becomes an adult. We used to say that was because it was a learned behavior and that's part of it, part of it. But we now know that there are also genetic alterations that occur in, in human beings as a result of these events. For me, a God who's talking to a child, well, drawing on my own experience as a father, there were times when I could not explain to my daughter and my son why I wanted them to do something. They didn't have the capacity of understanding it. Now, there were times when I really pushed their capacity to understand and told them things were inappropriate and tried to explain it. But when it really boiled down to and them looking at me blankly and saying, but why, Dad? I had to take that burden on myself and say, because I told you to. I think that's what's going on here with God in Exodus. I think he is taking that burden on himself. The burden of not being able to explain the complexity of the cause and effect processes that transfer the consequences of our sins to our children, our children's children, and our children's children. And he takes that burden on himself and he says, I did it. And you know what he did? He created this world according to the biblical worldview. He created this world and everything in it. He designed all of the systems. And while they have been corrupted by sin and changed by sin, he was the one that put things in motion. He was the one who spoke, and it was. And he takes all of that on himself. That is a part of what Isaiah was talking about when he, he says that our iniquities were placed upon him. He takes the entire burden of sin and suffering on himself. But you know what? There's good news in that commandment. That's the same verse, the same chapter, Exodus 20, that talks about God punishing the children and the grandchildren for the sins of the fathers then goes on in the next verse to say, but I bless thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You see, when we follow God's guidance, when we let our lives reflect 
his commandments and his leading in our lives the consequences are create ripples of blessing that extend not just a couple of generations but forever explaining the unexplainable there's many things I can't explain but you know what I trust the God who says because I said so be safe my friends I'm not going to tell you a COVID story this week it's too painful Instead, I want to encourage you to be safe, be prudent, but above all, keep looking up. As dark as this world appears right now, there is a better day coming. I hope to see you next week.